Good morning and welcome to Gamble Street Baptist Church. We welcome you to worship with us and to celebrate the life of Winona Elder Fair. Thank you for being here. It is a worship service, of course, and I ask you if you have something like this in your pocketbook or in your pocket or next to you, if you'd turn it off. The only sound-making device that we need today is your voice, and we want you to participate fully with us in our worship service. I'm Jim Spivey. I'm the pastor here. Suda Luttrell is our accompanist, and Natalia Volger is going to be leading us in worship and singing in just a few moments. Let's begin with prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to come and to worship you and to glorify you by lifting up your son, Jesus Christ, by worshiping together in your spirit as a fellowship, as a body of Christ, as we come to honor our dear friend, our mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, sister, Winona Elder Fair. We thank you for a life. It is an understatement to say well lived. For nine decades, she walked among us, ministered among us, took care of us, loved us. How faithful, well done, good and faithful servant. And for this, we give you thanks. And today, may everything that we say and do and sing and pray and breathe forward before you in the power of your Holy Spirit. May it be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Dad, I appreciate you writing this and the privilege to read it today. Um, on Thursday, the 14th of March, 2024, Winona, grandmother, 89, of Colleyville, Texas, and Clovis, New Mexico, entered the kingdom of God after a short illness. Her death, much like her life, was an example of a God-loving wife, mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. Before her passing, she told her daughter Carla that she was ready to see Jesus. Winona was born to James and Luella Tipton in Lubbock, Texas on 26th of June, 1934. Her mother, her mother discovered her curiosity and intellect early, which allowed Winona to advance several elementary school grades. Besides enjoying school, Winona loved to travel. Being a preacher's kid, she moved frequently. This would set the stage for a life of adventure and service for the Lord. Following her graduation from Cleburne, Texas High School at age 17, she ventured to Brownwood, Texas to Howard Payne College, where she met a handsome and charming young pastor, Carl A. Elder, whom she would marry the 21st of May, 1953. She graduated with a bachelor's degree in education. Her first adventure was with Carl as they moved to Alaska to start and serve at First Baptist Church Fairbanks. Even though Winona loved the the Alaskan adventure and service opportunity, she was ready when Carl accepted a pastoral position in Texas. This allowed her to blossom in her academic calling. While as a pastor's wife, Sunday school teacher, pianist, and mother to Mona, Car Carla, and Mark, she graduated from North Texas University with her master's degree in 1974 and her doctor of education degree in psychology and counseling in 1976. Her doctorate allowed Winona to be a teacher and have her own professional family counseling practice. These opportunities gave her a solid foundation for her to accept a position as a professor of psychology and counseling at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in 1984. Before her first retirement in 1998, she had sabbatical studies and taught counseling in Hong Kong and Brazil. After her first retirement, she accepted a position as distinguished fellow at B.H. Carroll Theological Institute in 2005, where she worked with doctoral students on their dissertation proposals and writing. She had her second retirement in 2012. Winona continued to serve as a teacher and a pianist at various churches where she and Carl attended. After Carl's death, she and her dear friend from Howard Payne, Marshall Fair, reacquainted and married on January 12, 2018 in Clovis, New Mexico. While in Clovis, she served in churches and continued to travel with Marshall. A life well lived in service to the Lord, Winona is preceded in death by Carl and her son, Mark Elder. She survived by her husband, Marshall, brother Stan Tipton, daughters Mona Figueroa, Carla Perry, husband Charles, 
grandchildren Heather Bennett, Corey Hall, Christopher Perry, Clinton Perry, Cameron Perry, Anthony Elder, and Stephen Elder, and 11 great-grandchildren. And then to, to finish, well done, good and faithful servant, grandmother. Once again, we really thank you and appreciate all of you being here. I know that a lot of you have your own stories about my mother, and they're beautiful, and we, we appreciate um, your fondness of her. <sighs> this is hard. We're never really prepared for the sharpness of death and the final reality of life here on earth. My mother was eloquent, beautiful lady, inside and out, and lived her life for Jesus. Abraham Lincoln said, and I quote, Be sure you put your feet in the right place, then stand firm. She absolutely stood firm on the solid rock of Jesus in her beliefs and convictions. Yes, I will mourn her loss, celebrate her life as a faithful, godly servant. My heart is broken in her passing, but a songwriter recently wrote, a heart that's broke is a heart that's been loved. I feel her stride of joy in the Lord with me, nudging me to look at her legacy as an absolute blessing and comfort and to follow in her example. Born in the West, she was always stirring up the dust. She told me several months ago she was a pill as a child, always in trouble and stirring things up. I was so surprised by this revelation. She was exceptionally bright, and my granny called her a genius. She was. She took piano lessons at an early age, and it took to her, excelling so well that her parents excused her from doing the dishes so she could practice. She learned hymns and played most by memory. I loved hearing her practice. I loved hearing her play, as she did, for all the churches my dad pastored. What a treasure music was in her life, all her life, and in our family. The desire to serve playing the piano never left her as she recently played for the nursing home, Hymns with Winona. The residents loved it so much. In my life, my mother shared so many of her passions with me. Traveling was her greatest desire and interest. She wanted to see the world, but most important, the United States. She had the privilege to visit all states except for three, North Dakota, Delaware, and Connecticut. Over the course of her adult life, she visited 18 national parks, six presidential libraries, three war museums, and seven memorials. She took me on my 50th birthday back to my birthplace at Fairbanks, Alaska. Around the morning bed and breakfast table, she had the best stories to tell, having lived in Fairbanks for a total of five years before and after I was born. The folks at the table were enthralled. I was mesmerized. What a special memory. Tra her travel stories and trips have been to me, and I will treasure them forever, especially the ones I took with her. I could go on and on about how wonderful my mother was. She thought family was extremely important and took good care of us in our household. She supported me in all my career endeavors and faith journey. We had fun, too. Shopping was in our DNA, and we had many out outings to malls and lunches together, just enjoying each other's company. We engaged in great conversation about education, her work, and how meaningful and important it was to her. In her final eight months here, after her relocation from Clovis, New Mexico, I was blessed to get to spend more time with her. It wasn't always easy. Leukemia was hard on her body and mind. As best as she could, she remained stoic, faithful, kind, and willing to endure. 
She told me repeatedly that she was not afraid to die. As a resident at the nursing home, she taught Bible study to other residents, purposefully sharing Bible stories, her faith, and a genuine love and boldness to the end for her Savior, Jesus Christ. I will always hold in my heart that this was a message to me as well, God nudging me to live my remaining days in service and teaching about Jesus. What a gift. In the last three weeks, I prayed for special moments with her. I could sense her body failing and her strength depleting. I was given numerous precious moments that bring tears of joy and gladness to my heart. With all the strength she could muster on Wednesday afternoon a week ago, she told me she loved me. I will hold those last words uttered dear in my heart forever. While I know she is walking the streets of gold, maybe playing dominoes with my dad, or playing hymns of praise, praises to Jesus, I will miss her every single day. And I will wish that heaven had visiting hours so I could drop by and stay a while. As a friend recently told me, it's a warm blessing knowing that my dear sweet mother is living in paradise with our heavenly father. Way to go, mother. Good and faithful servant. Mona, Carla, and the family. I heard about all of you. I've known your grandparents and parents for 22 years. I met them in this church. Any grandchild had any achievement, I heard about it. She was so proud of all of you. And I will cherish the memories of Carl and Winona deep in my heart. They were wonderful people, example of Christian faith, and as you said, stoic and firm in their foundation. I hope that all of your grandchildren and great-grandchildren will follow their steps. You have a great legacy that so many people do not have. Thank you for sharing them with us. Now, it's time to sing, because your grandmother liked to sing. Uh, and there is a hymnal in front of you, and we will, the first hymn there is number 48. Would you please stand together?
Well, Natalia, we would want you to know that our grandmother adored you, and uh, we heard all about you as well. So, um, I, I also would like to, before I start, for you all to know that my aunt and I did not talk about what we were writing, but I think you will see uh, just the impact of my grandmother through both of our stories, as they are similar. <laughs> uh, grandmother left an amazing legacy. Legacy is the sum of the personal values, accomplishments, and actions that resonate with people around you. Here are some things that resonate with me about the legacy my grandmother leaves behind. A legacy of learning. She was an avid learner and lover of history. She valued education, learning, as well as teaching. A legacy of hospitality. She was very adept in the kitchen and always made it a point to bake our favorite things when we came to visit. She taught us how to host others and make them feel loved and cared for. As only a grandmother would, she allowed us to have ice cream at 10 o'clock at night when we were at her house. A legacy of adventure and travel. She loved to travel and see different places. She and granddad took my brother and myself to Washington, D.C. for a vacation. This is perhaps the most talked about vacation between grandmother and I. You see, we walked all over Washington, D.C., seeing everything. We were so exhausted. Finally, we found a park bench to sit down and rest. And as we looked up across the lake was the Jefferson Memorial. And my dear sweet grandmother looked at all three of us and said, okay, is everyone ready to go see the Jefferson Memorial? There were three very emphatic no's. She returned years later to see the Jefferson Memorial for herself. A legacy of faith. Jesus has always been the center of our family. And while grandmother was more fundamental in her beliefs, she always expressed a desire to follow him in faith. Her worship was most often expressed through music. A legacy of the arts. She was a wonderful pianist, truly a gift of hers to sit and play hymns with no hymn book. She loved musicals and shared that love with us, having introduced us to the sound of music, My Fair Lady, and our favorite, Calamity Jane. The greatest memory are the 30 years that she and I would sit at the piano and play hymns together. The one we always played was, It Is Well With My Soul. So it seems fitting that I close with the words I have played and sung with her for much of my life and know in my heart. When peace, like a river, attendeth my soul, when sorrows, like sea billows, roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. It's interesting that you learn more in death about someone than you do in life. Very interesting. But let's pray at this time. Our Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. This morning we come before your throne through the blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. On behalf of the family, the elder family, the fair family, in remembrance of a beloved wife, a beloved mother, a beloved grandmother, and even a great-grandmother who was able to live a full life and considering the nine decades that she was here, it's a full life. And at this time, we're reminded that it's better to go into a house of mourning than to a house of feasting.
to contemplate the lives, our lives, the life of our beloved Winona Elder, grandmother. And Heavenly Father, at this time, we remember grandmother and her influence in our lives, the times past, present, and even it will live on in our future has been described through the reflections, the legacy of both of them that they've given to the family, friends. We're reminded in the psalmist, when the psalmist said, I shall not die, but live, and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, I will go into them. I will praise the Lord, this gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. The psalmist, the Father, encourages us to live faithfully as you have commanded, to praise your works to the next generation, so that we may be one day welcomed into your gates and into your presence. Father, may we all choose to live according to your word and do thy will and not ours. Heavenly Father, you have given us a blessing in the life of Winona Elder, grandmother. And may we always remember the most important things that she would give to us and leave to us, which we've been heard said over and over is to be faithful unto death and you should receive a crown of righteousness the crown of life. And so, Father, as we reflect and continue to reflect on her life, let it serve as a full life of example of good living. And so, Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I was told that this was selected by the youngest daughter, but the family as a whole. And perhaps it serves as an epitaph for our lives, perhaps a message that we should take with us as grandmother would want us to have it. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9 and 10, the Apostle Paul, writing to a region of churches that were under some influence, that were under ultimately those that were trying to keep them from doing what's right. And perhaps there are times in our lives that there are those that keep us from doing what's right. And so here it is, he says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And as we therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men especially unto them who are the household of faith. Let us remember that as our epitaph as we leave here this morning. Let's stand and sing one of Bueno's favorite hymn, number 573. <laughs>
It was a Tuesday that day in June, back in 1934, the 26th of June, when Winona was born, as you've read and heard, in Lubbock, Texas. Her parents had been married for about 18 months. In fact, they had been married on Christmas Day, which was a Sunday that year in 1932. James Spurgeon Tipton had been born in Dime Box, Texas, in South Central Texas in 1904. His family had immigrated from Tennessee to Alabama and then finally to South Central Texas in about 1880. His dad was a farmer. James himself was a Baptist preacher and a watch repairman. They lived for a while in Brownwood, Texas in the early 40s, and then they moved to Fort Worth, and he worked at Haltom's Jewelry for a while. And then they finally settled in Alvarado and Cleburne area, finally in Cleburne, where he continued to work as a jeweler from the late 40s on. Her mother, Luella Stiles, was born in Eastland, Texas, eight years after her husband. Twelve generations before, her ancestor, John Stiles, had moved from London and had immigrated in the second wave of English immigrants into Virginia. So Jamestown, 1607, just 20 years later, 1627. Six generations lived in Virginia. They thought that they would stay there forever, but no, one of them finally decided to move west, young man. And four generations lived in Tennessee until Luella's dad, Edgar Rufus Stiles, who was a Baptist preacher, he came here as a young boy in about 1890 in West Texas. He ministered, preached in Tennessee, Alabama, Arkansas, Texas, and New Mexico. Winona, as you've heard, had one brother, has one brother, Stanley. He was born three years later in July. Early school, you've heard, she graduated from Cleburne High School, 1951. There she was president of the Spanish Club. She was president of the Future Homemakers of America. Doesn't surprise us at all, a leader from the very beginning. She was a member of the Future Te uh, Teachers of America, and she was that. She was a teacher. And it comes as no surprise, she was the accompanist for the Glee Club. That year then, she started Howard Payne, where you've heard she met the love of her life, Carl, who was a junior at that time, and she was about two and a half years younger than he. Carl had been called to preach four years earlier when he was 16, and he had earned an associate degree at Decatur Bible College. What is Decatur Bible College today? DBU, of course. They married in May of 1953 in Brownsville, and then uh, she married into a large family. If you were here last November uh, for Lloyd's funeral, and then almost seven years, six and a half years ago for Carl's, you know, there were 15 children. Carl had 14 siblings, nine boys, five girls. He probably had his closest relationship with his brother Lloyd and his sister-in-law, Sue Bristow, and the four of them often went on trips together. They were very close together. Proverbs 18.24 says that there is a friend that is closer than a brother. Well, they flipped it around. There was a brother that was closer than a friend. The couples traveled together, vacation together, loved playing 42 together. Carl would drive, and Lloyd, you might expect, had the map out and was charting the way, and he was the navigator. Carl and Winona had three children, Mona Lou, Carla Gay, and Mark Allen, of course, who is not with us now. They were married for over 63 years. As you've heard, the first place that they went after they married was to Alaska. They packed up a trailer, an 18-foot trailer, and drove it from here across the great continent to Alaska, and there they helped to restart first uh, the uh, North Pole Baptist Church, First Baptist Church North Pole, which was a mission of First Baptist Fairbanks. And then they moved back to Texas in 1954, and Mona was born in Collingsworth, Texas that year in May. In 1955, Carl finally graduated from Howard Payne College, and a little bit later, the next year, Winona got her B.S., her Bachelor of Science, then from North Texas State College. From 1957 to 1960, they took another pastorate 
and Alaska. And then, of course, you've heard Carla talk about having been born in Fairbanks. And then they moved back in 1960 to Texas, and Mark was born here in the Metroplex in November. In 1967, Wont Winona got her Master of Education degree from North Texas University. The name had changed. And in the next year, Carl, right across the street, got his master's degree from Southwestern. In that year, they moved to what we here call pioneer territory, to Ohio. I don't, I don't know if American Baptists appreciate that very much, but he worked for the Home Mission Board as pastor for four years, and she accompanied him there, of course, and accompanied with the playing of the piano. Four years later, they then moved back to Texas, and Carl became associate pastor First Baptist Plano, responsible for outreach. And he and Winona helped plant two churches that continue in existence, Prairie Creek Baptist Church and Hunter's Glen Baptist Church. Winona, during that time as she pursued her doctorate, was a public school teacher and a counselor. She was an adjunct teacher and graduate assistant at North Texas, and she also instructed psychology at Dallas College at their Brookhaven campus. She also helped to direct a program for as a therapist in an alcohol recovery program. In 1976, Winona got her doctorate in education from North Texas State University, of course, now UNT. And she began a private practice, licensed psychologist in Carrollton. In 1978, two years later, Carl became pastor of Liberty Baptist Church in Plano, and then four years later, became pastor of a church plant in Carrollton. That was just two years short of a major change in both of their lives. In 1984, and for the next 11 years, Carl then was consultant with the Baptist General Convention of Texas, where he helped with church planning and his heart's intent by vocational ministry, as it was Lloyd's. In 1984, that year, Winona joined Southwestern's faculty, and she remained there for 14 years until she, as you heard from the obituary, then entered her first retirement. She was then director of the Walsh Center for Counseling, and she was a guest professor a couple of times overseas, first at the Baptist Theological Seminary in North Brazil, and then at Hong Kong Baptist Theological Seminary. That year, they also joined Gamble Street in 1984. They were members here for 32 years, till 2016. There was a brief interlude for five and a half years where Carl was pastor in Dennis, just outside Weatherford, and he did interim work, and often Winona would go with him to those interim pastorates, but often she was here on her own. From 2004 onward then, she entered a second vocation with Carroll Institute, and so did Carl. He helped to raise money for Carroll Institute in the first three years. He would walk around the streets of Weatherford and go to merchants and ask them to contribute to the founding of Carroll Institute. In 2005, Winona then became a distinguished fellow at Carroll, and she supervised many PhD students in the psychology and counseling program until she entered her second and final retirement in 2012. Her memberships were in the American Psychological Association, the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapists, and the American Association of Christian Counselors. She was also certified as a family life educator with the National Council of Family Relations and a supervisor of American Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. And of course, as you know, on on, on Monday, the 21st of November, Carl then went to be home with the Lord, and we did his service here after Thanksgiving that next week on the 29th. Two years later, and I hope that he is listening today, in Clovis, New Mexico, she married Marshall Fair in Clovis on the 12th of January. Marshall was from Monahans, Texas, Baptist minister who served several years in Wyoming and then in New Mexico, and he had been previously married to Marjorie Margot Norrell, who had died five years earlier in 2013. Three years later, Winona's son Mark passed away in September, September the 21st. He had been chaplain of Baylor Grapevine Hospital for many years and then director of spiritual care and clinical ethics at St. David's Hospital in Austin. And then last summer, 
after she had been diagnosed with leukemia. She broke her hip and she moved back here to rehab and she lived on the border of Colleyville and Grapevine. And of course, as you know, Thursday before last, the 14th of March, she passed away after a brief illness. I asked some folks to share their reflections in addition to the family today about Winona. Bud Smith, longtime colleague in the religious education school with her at Southwestern, says that she was always loving and caring toward her students. But, but, she always demanded excellence from them. She wasn't a pushover. She didn't give in to their petitions to perform to a lesser degree than she expected from them. She was slow to react in difficult situations, but when she did, you knew where she stood. And then her response was always well thought out, and it was always accurate and right. Whenever she walked into a room, well, take a look at the bulletin at the front. You see it? That smile brightened the room. It punched a hole in the darkness. And whenever you talk to Winona, and I will testify to this as many of you will, whenever you talk to her, you knew that she was not talking at you. You knew that she was listening to you, and she gave you her full attention. Scott Floyd, uh, one of her longtime colleagues at the, in the psychology and counseling department at Southwestern, says this, she was highly respected by her students and colleagues for her professionalism. She was a well-versed practitioner. It wasn't just book knowledge for her. She had a lot of experience, and she came by it naturally. She was a craftsman in the art of counseling, a person of great integrity. What she said, she did. What she did, she said. What you saw was the real thing, a person of gracious spirit. She genuinely cared. She cared for people, and she made people feel valued. It wasn't just a job for her. Steady leadership in good times and also in difficult times, and there were some difficult times. She never wavered whether the times were good or bad, and she always was a leader people could follow. My reflections are these. I would describe Winona as a cheerful realist. That smile she was always optimistic, smiling and encouraging, but she was also pragmatic. She did not suffer fools lightly. You know what I mean. She didn't take things for face value. She asked the hard questions to make sure that we were going in the right direction. She wasn't overly talkative. She wasn't a chatty Cathy. She was thoughtful. She thought before she spoke, and like E.F. Hutton, when she spoke, people what? They listened. I would say that, you know, there's an expression that we use, person has a, a servant's heart, and, and that, that's okay. But I believe she had a servant's soul. She had a heart for practical ministry and helping others. She and Carl both devoted their career mainly to helping small churches, as in fact Lloyd and Sue did. A servant's soul. She was adventuresome and had a tireless pioneer spirit, as you've heard. Together, they served eight churches in Alaska, Ohio, and Texas, and they planted six more. And she was an adventuresome person when she came on board with us at Carroll Institute and helped to start a new theological institution from scratch. The common denominator I hear in a lot of this between her and Carl both was that they were always faithful to the very end. You know, when you go back and look at the worship service that we did for Carl over six years ago, we began with the same hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. You know, friends, family, when we lament, and we do at times like this, we're reminded of Jeremiah's words in Lamentations. You know, Jeremiah was lamenting. It was near the beginning of Israel's long exile, Babylonian captivity. And in the middle of this dirge where Jeremiah is lamenting, grieving over the destruction of Jerusalem, in his darkest moment, 
when all seemed hopelessly lost, Jeremiah called upon God. Lamentations 3. Remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and bitterness. Surely my soul remembers, and it's bowed down within me. And then I recall this to my mind, and I have hope. The Lord's mercies never end, for his compassions they fail not. They're new every morning. Great, help me here, great is thy what? Faithfulness. You see, the Lord is my portion, says my soul, and therefore I have hope in him. There's a message in this song for us today as we lament our loss and as we grieve and as we mourn. You know, some say, well, it's a life well lived. 90 years, she had a long and full life. Yes, but it makes the grief no less for us. In fact, it makes the mourning even more deep and profound. As we, met, as we lament our loss, we remember Winona's faith in the Lord. When we look at this song, when we awaken tomorrow, and we're reminded yet once again with a bittersweet memory that, in fact, she walks with us no longer. When the words, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, have a grating echo in our ears, we take comfort. We take comfort in the witness that she and Carl have left with us in this great hymn by Thomas Chisholm. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no what shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions. They fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new what? Mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter, springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Pardon for peace, for sin, and peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today, and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings are mine and 10,000 beside. I know that we have sung it. I know I've repeated it. And guess what? For about five minutes, I'm going to preach it. You see, with Winona and with Carl both, they remind us that God is faithful to the very end and beyond. His faithfulness is bigger, it's deeper, his faithfulness is stronger than all of our needs, than all of our desires and all of our hopes. He is faithful because he is, the word means in the original language, steadfast, secure. He is firm, constantly reliable, and in the words of another hymn, he is the immovable rock of ages. God is faithful today even as we mourn and grieve. His nature and holy being are constant. His compassion never fails. It's ever flowing, never failing, always caring and watching over us. David reminds us of this in Psalm 103. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He's mindful of earth to earth, ashes to ashes, and dust to dust. He is mindful of the fact that we are composed of dust. God is faithful, and he's compassionate. His mercy greets us at the break of every dawn when we wake up. Whether or not we are prepared to meet it, it meets us even to our very last day. David continues in that psalm, and he says, As for us, our days are like what? They are like grass. As a, as a flower of the field, so we flourish. When the wind has passed over it, that, that is over the flower, it is no more, and its place acknowledges it no longer. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting for those who fear him. Chisholm reminds us that God is faithful. He is compassionate. 
and he's merciful. And he always provides. He provides not just enough, but more than enough to meet our every need. Paul tells the Philippians, and my God will supply. He will provide all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. And God's people affirm with Paul. They say what? Amen. God is faithful. He's compassionate, he's merciful, and he provides. And his unfailing love is more reliable and more durable than the seasons of the year as they come and go year after year, decade after decade, for nine decades. And they are more reliable, his love is, than all the celestial bodies that heaven has been set timelessly in motion by God. The psalmist tells us again, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. And if you remember that from Psalm 136, he says it 26 times. Open the bulletin for just a minute, would you? Steadfast love. There it is on the left side. You see it? Read it with me. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. His love is steadfast. He is faithful, he is compassionate, he is merciful, the one who provides and the one who loves. His pardon is unconditional and boundless, ever forgiving. Micah tells us, who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious acts of his chosen people? (laughs) He does not retain his anger forever, but he delights in us because of his unchanging love. If we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is what? He is faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us not of some, but all of our unrighteousness. God is faithful. God is compassionate. God is merciful. He is the one who provides and loves and pardons. His peace is fixed in our hearts. His peace calms every anxiety, every worry and fear. Peace I leave with you, Jesus told his disciples. My peace I give unto you, and not as the world gives do I give to you. And then he says what? What he said at the beginning of that chapter. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and don't let yourself be fearful. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, with prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God and the what? The peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. He's compassionate. He's merciful who provides and loves and pardons and gives peace. His strength. His strength carries us every step of the way, even through the valley of the shadow of death, the psalmist tells us. Isaiah goes on to say, do not fear, don't be anxious, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Chisholm is almost finished. God is faithful. God is compassionate. God is merciful. He provides. He loves. He pardons. He gives peace and strength. And then he crowns it with hope. His hope is forever, giving us eternal life in Christ Jesus, his son. When Ona trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as her Savior, she died to self. She took up her cross and she followed him. And she can affirm today, as she stands with the saints in heaven, praising her Father, glorifying the Son, and worshiping even then in the Spirit. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again 
as Jesus promised, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. For what reason? The promise is, and she has claimed it, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, which is reserved for you in heaven if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. His compassions, they fail not. He is merciful and he is the one who provides, who loves, who pardons, who gives peace and strength and hope. Yes, because she trusted in Christ, because Carl trusted in Christ. That circle has not been broken. They are together in God's glory. And today, even though we mourn and even though we grieve, we can sing a new song with joy, even in tough times. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Great is thy faithfulness, mercy and love. Pardon for sin and peace that endureth thine own presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine and 10,000 beside. A new song written at the beginning of the 20th century. But folks, there's an even newer song. There is an even newer song that we can claim in the face of death as it opens its yawning, gaping mouth and seeks to devour us. Death itself is what? Swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Family and friends, he promises, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will send you one who will comfort you, and he has. He asked the Father, and the Father sent through the Son his Holy Spirit. He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never depart. And at times like this, words from human beings don't bring total comfort. Even sermons from pulpits and even testimonies and songs don't bring total comfort. But the comfort of the Holy Spirit, I pray, will reach down into the inner recesses of your soul and strengthen them and remind you that even though weeping lasts for a night, joy comes in the morning. And we have that testimony from Winona, and we celebrate that today. A life marvelously lived. Well done, good and faithful servant. Please stand as we sing our final hymnal, uh, our final hymn uh, in our hymnal number 619, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine.
Appreciate everyone being here today. Appreciate Dr. Spivey and Gamble Street. Uh, it's amazing how quickly things can come together in a short period of time. And I appreciate everybody being here. Representatives of Dallas Baptist College University, uh, B.H. Carroll and Southwestern, we appreciate y'all being here. As you testified to me and to Carla and the rest of the family, how important Winona was to their life and to their ministry and to their service. What I like to reflect upon as we close out here is mom's life was a, a life of service, ministry, and teaching up until the day she, she died. And I was looking back at her notes or her Bible study there at the retirement center, and she really was a Baptist preacher teacher at heart. <laughs> she had three points in a prayer. The first one was Jesus encounters us each and every day. Jesus teaches us, and Jesus loves us. As we see in this uh, passage, uh, John chapter 11, it's about the death of Lazarus, and it just so happens that tomorrow's Palm Sunday and Easter is next week. And those Palm Sunday and Easter is near and dear to Anoah's heart. She really loved teaching others about the love of Jesus and what Jesus has meant to her, but also what Jesus could do for their life. As we read here a little bit about Lazarus in chapter 11, you know, Lazarus had died and he was a dear friend uh, to uh, Jesus and Jesus loved him as it, we, we see there later in the verses there. But also there's Mary and Martha. And so Jesus took his time going to see Lazarus. He wasn't in a hurry. And y'all can read the chapter and kind of discern what was going on there. But he wanted to be a teachable moment. He wanted to encounter with people there. He wanted to have a teachable moment and also show his love by his caring, his caring spirit. And so we see here that as he encounters Martha, she said, Jesus, if you had been here, he would not have died. Of course, Jesus, you know, he took that all in. And then a verse later, he says, you know, he said, he will rise again. And of course, Mary said, well, certainly he will at the end times. He said, well, no, Martha, you don't quite understand. And here are the key verses here, verse 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will excuse me, will live even though they die and whoever lives by will believe and who will never die. Do you believe this? And of course, that was the most important question that Winona asked when she spoke to others. And she, up till that week before she passed, she had prepared her Bible study and she really wanted the residents there. And of course, some of them understood, some of them didn't understand, but she was faithful to the end. And I think that's what's important in our own life is that are we faithful to the end of our life? Do people know the difference that Christ makes in our life? Have we had an encounter with Christ? Do we teach others about Christ? And most importantly, do we love Christ with all our heart? So again, thank you for being here. I'm going to close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for Winona's life of encouraging others and teaching them about the love of Christ. We're grateful for the eight months that we had with her, reminding us of her remarkable life. Thank you that she is happy and healthy in your presence. In the days ahead as we reflect Winona's life, Lord, remind us of Paul's words in Ephesians 3 about Jesus' love. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. To know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do measurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that works within us and to him be glory in the church and to Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you.